In the chilly month of January 2010, the tranquility of the Asda Superstore car park in Robroyston, Glasgow, was shattered by an event that would linger long in the memory of local shoppers. Amidst the parked cars, a clandestine meeting was taking place inside a nondescript black Audi A3, where Kevin Carroll, a 30-year-old man infamous in Glasgow's underworld, sat with two associates. They had gathered discreetly for a rendezvous with a fellow drug dealer, a common occurrence for those ensnared in the city's shadowy criminal dealings. As the meeting dispersed and the visitor left the confines of the Audi, an ominous silence pervaded. Suddenly that silence was broken by the echo of gunfire, a sound so startling that one shopper was haunted by flashbacks to the Dunblane massacre. Two figures had materialised, their intentions deadly, and with ruthless efficiency, they dispatched Carol in a chilling execution that bore all the hallmarks of a gangland hit. This brutal assassination, witnessed by unsuspecting bystanders, marked a critical juncture in Glasgow's turbulent streets, where a relentless feud had raged for a decade. The heart of this strife was the fierce rivalry between the Lions and the Daniels, two family gangs locked in a vicious battle for supremacy over the city's heroin and cocaine market. The immediate aftermath saw an intense police crackdown, which momentarily quelled the tit-for-tat violence that had become a grim staple of life in Glasgow, offering a brief respite in a city long plagued by gang warfare. Welcome to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel, where I unravel the veiled tales of cryptic crimes. The origins of the grim saga that led to Kevin Carroll's brazen murder under the harsh light of day, trace back to the innocuous setting of a school playground. Carol's long-standing animosity with the Lyons family had its roots in those early years, marked by skirmishes with members of the clan. It was during this formative period that Carol also cemented alliances with the progeny of crime lord Jamie Daniels, Robert Daniel and Francis Fraggle Green, who would emerge as his staunchest allies. Kevin Carroll entered the world on the 24th of August 1980 his arrival marked at Glasgow's Stobhill Hospital. Notably, the birth certificate bore only one parent's name, his mother Elizabeth. Kevin, alongside his elder sibling David, then aged 34, spent their early childhood in Drumchapel. However, a move to the more formidable Milton estate in the city's north came when Kevin was merely a decade old. A playful moniker bestowed upon him by a cousin, inspired by Kevin the gerbil from the television puppet show Roland Rat, would later evolve into a notorious alias. By his teenage years, Carroll had already attracted the attention of law enforcement, culminating in a three-month incarceration for car theft at the age of 19. Nonetheless, it wasn't long before his ambitions gravitated towards more profitable, albeit perilous, ventures. By his mid-twenties, Carroll had delved into the drug trade, demonstrating a ruthless approach to those who faltered in their payments. This pivot not only proved financially rewarding, but also solidified Gerbil's position as a formidable figure vexing both the police and the elite Scottish Crime and Drug Enforcement Agency with his activities. Within the fierce struggle for control over Glasgow's territories, Kevin Carroll emerged as the most volatile factor amidst the ongoing conflict between the Lyons and the Daniels crime families. His conduct escalated the already tense atmosphere, bringing the rivalry to the brink of chaos. Carroll was notorious for employing extreme measures such as using a blowtorch and scalding water to torment his victims before pilfering their drugs, cash and weaponry. This brutal method of operation led to his gang being dubbed the Alien Abduction Gang, as the severely traumatised victims reported to the police having no recollection of their harrowing experiences. The gang's modus operandi involved abducting individuals, frequently associated with adversary factions, straight from their residences under the guise of armed police officers. Victims were then blindfolded and transported to either secure locations or abandoned structures to endure severe physical and psychological abuse. In some instances, power tools were employed to further the torment. On one occasion, a drug dealer was ambushed during a transaction, only for Carol's gang to seize four kilos of cocaine valued at approximately 50,000 pounds, with the mere proclamation, you're taxed, you bam, ensuring compliance through intimidation rather than violence. In a particularly audacious move, Carroll learned of a soldier attempting to illicitly sell a stolen SA-80 rifle, standard issue for the British Army, equipped with a tripod and an infrared sight for £10,000. The Lions showed initial interest, placing a £4,000 deposit. However, before they could secure the firearm, Carroll is alleged to have abducted the soldier, subjecting him to torturous ordeals with a blowtorch. 
This intense coercion led the terrified soldier to surrender both the weapon and the deposit. The protracted and violent conflict between the Lions and Daniel's clans has been extensively covered by the press over the years. Detailing every skirmish and confrontation would fill an entire hour-long program. Yet two pivotal events stand out, embodying the ruthless and relentless nature of their struggle for supremacy. The initial incident unfolded in early December 2006 at Apple Row Motors in Lamb Hill, a business run by David Lyons, the sibling of the Lyons family patriarch, Eddie Sr. The scene was reminiscent of a cinematic gangster showdown, yet it played out in the stark reality of North Glasgow. Two individuals, cloaked in long black coats, masks concealing their faces and armed with handguns, strode onto the premises and unleashed a barrage of gunfire. The altercation was brief, yet in its aftermath, the young Michael Lyons, aged 21, and nephew to David Lyons, lay deceased. Additionally, his cousin Stephen sustained severe injuries, as did Robert Pickett, a member of their entourage. The assailants, identified as Daniel family affiliates Raymond Anderson and James MacDonald, were subsequently apprehended and handed down a historic sentence of 35 years each by the Scottish courts, a term later reduced to 30 years on appeal. This sentencing signalled a newfound judicial sternness towards organised crime, surpassing even that of Abdul Basit al Megrahi, the mastermind behind the Lockerbie bombing. The catalyst for this bloody episode was likely a drive-by shooting targeting Kevin Gerbil Carroll and his associate Ross Sherlock in Alcan and Bishop Briggs, just three weeks prior, marking the second attempt on Carroll's life, the first occurring outside his mother's residence in Milton nearly three years earlier. However, what escalated the feud to a more personal level was the belief amongst the Lions that Carol had desecrated the grave of Gary Lyons, Eddie Senior's son, who had succumbed to leukemia in 1991. This act of disrespect towards a family grave was seen as an unforgivable transgression by the Daniels, further entrenching the vendetta between the two families. In the wake of the shooting, it was hardly surprising that witnesses were reluctant to step forward. The menacing aura surrounding the individuals caught up in the incident made it clear they were deeply entangled in criminal activities. Investigators thus shifted their focus to the figure who had exited the vehicle mere moments before the gunmen made their fatal approach. That individual was Stephen Glenn, called to a clandestine meeting with Carol in the car park of an Asda in Rob Royston, known locally as the Aztec Car Park. Glenn, who harboured a palpable fear of Carol due to his notoriety for extreme violence, had agreed to the rendezvous believing the public setting would afford him a degree of safety. In court, Glenn openly acknowledged his involvement in drug dealing, operating under the directive of an individual known as Alan Johnston, or by his moniker, Babesy. On the 12th of January, Carol initiated contact with Glenn, expressing his desire for a meeting. Despite Johnston's warnings against such a meeting, Carol's subsequent text message was menacingly clear, threatening to invade Glenn's home if he refused. Moreover, Carol's message provocatively demanded, bring that bitch Babesy with you. In a move to ensure his safety, Glenn enlisted his friend Jason O'Connell to discreetly monitor the meeting from the safety of the Asda Cafe. When pressed in court about the specifics of their conversation, Glenn struggled to recount the details, but summarized the essence of Carol's message. From that point forward, Glenn was to work for him, and any defiance would be met with severe repercussions. In the ensuing chaos, Glenn was gripped by panic upon hearing rumors that the police were on the lookout for anyone who had been in contact with Carol. In a bid to clarify his position, he reached out to the authorities, proposing to come forward the following week to share his insights. However, before he could make good on his word, he was taken into custody. After a thorough review of his account, the police concluded that his version of events held water. Consequently, Glenn was treated not as a suspect, but as a witness to the grim affair. As for Kevin Carroll, his fate was sealed. The activation of the child's safety locks on the backseat doors stripped him of any avenue for escape. Confronted with the sight of two masked figures advancing towards him, guns in hand, one can scarcely imagine the dread that engulfed him. In a desperate, albeit futile attempt to shield himself, Carroll grabbed a car manual, hoping to deflect the incoming bullets. Nevertheless, his efforts were in vain. The assailants fired a total of 13 shots through the Audi A3's window over the span of 25 seconds, ending his life instantly. An ambulance worker, later recounting the scene, described Carroll's final moments with stark clarity. He observed a bullet wound in Carroll's forehead, with visible skull fragments scattered across the back seat, alongside another injury on his hand. Carroll showed no signs of life. The aftermath saw the murder weapons discarded behind a library in Coatbridge, eventually discovered by a gardener. 
The stolen Golf used as a getaway vehicle was found ablaze on a rural road in Glen Mavis. Faced with the underworld's customary silence, the police investigation seemed destined for a dead end. However, the discovery of the murder weapon marked a turning point, offering law enforcement their first significant lead and the identification of an initial suspect in the case. The investigation into Carroll's murder proved to be a vexing endeavour for Police Scotland, primarily due to the scant physical evidence at their disposal. However, the turning point came with DNA test results that implicated Ross Monaghan, a high-ranking member of the Lions Gang with a criminal record as a convicted cocaine dealer and a reputation within the underworld. In May 2012, Monaghan faced trial for Carroll's murder, but the proceedings came to an abrupt end as the case against him unravelled, ultimately leading to his acquittal. The murder weapons, a pistol and a revolver, were stumbled upon by six council gardeners 13 days post-crime, discarded behind Coatbridge Library on Academy Street, North Lanarkshire. In a critical oversight, the gardeners, wearing wet gloves, handled and passed the weapons amongst themselves. DNA traces found on the pistol were matched to Monaghan, yet forensic experts faced challenges in establishing how his DNA came to be on the weapon, given the minuscule quantity detected, merely one billionth of a gram or 0.1 of a nanogram. The court was informed that the average human sheds around 4,000 cells, each containing roughly one nanogram of DNA daily. Furthermore, evidence revealed that DNA from at least three other individuals was present on the gun. Given these complexities, Judge Lord Brailsford expressed to the jury that it was inconceivable to determine the means by which Monaghan's DNA found its way onto the pistol, whether through direct contact or via secondary or tertiary transfer with the possibility of a more indirect mode of transmission not ruled out. Following his release, Monaghan, who was 30 years old at the time, commented on his ordeal, describing it as a nightmare. After the tumultuous trial and acquittal of Monaghan, the focus of the investigation shifted. I'm relieved this chapter has closed. I've consistently maintained my innocence in this matter, was Monaghan's sentiment post-acquittal. The narrative took another turn in 2015, with the apprehension of Billy Puff Patterson, another member of the Lions gang, immediately following his arrival from a flight originating in Malaga. The case against Patterson was primarily built on DNA evidence and an analysis of telephonic records. The prosecution detailed that merely 10 days subsequent to the fatal shooting, with the police investigation intensifying, Patterson had departed for Spain on January 23, 2010. This move came as suspicions began to converge on him leading to the issuance of an international arrest warrant in August of the same year. Investigators had painstakingly reconstructed Patterson's movements by analysing his mobile phone activity and scrutinising countless hours of CCTV footage. This meticulous effort tracked his trajectory to the car park on the day of the incident and his subsequent flight abroad. The narrative of the crime, as presented in court, was pieced together through the phone records of two mobiles purportedly owned by Patterson the prosecution argued that these records depicted the sequence of events surrounding the murder with as much clarity as if the acts were being witnessed directly. It was disclosed that one mobile, identifiable by its last four digits as 1411, was active in the vicinity of the Asda store at the moment of the shooting. Patterson acknowledged the other mobile as his. Significantly, it was revealed that both phones on 87 separate occasions throughout January 2010 were activated within five minutes of each other never engaged in contact with one another, yet consistently operated within the same geographical region. A telecommunications expert posited before the court that for the phones to exhibit such synchronized activity, yet remain unconnected, their owners would ostensibly need to be inseparable. Further analysis by CellSight linked the 1411 number to the location captured on CCTV of the Volkswagen Golf used during the crime, proximate to Asda shortly before the murder, and subsequently near where the firearms were discarded. The revelation of the data represented a significant breakthrough for the police, but spelled misfortune for William Patterson. The prosecutor disclosed that another individual had saved the pivotal 1411 number in his phone, labeling it Billy. Alex Prentice QC, the lead prosecutor, noted that at 2.11 p.m., shortly after the murder, this particular phone was switched off, suggesting it served its purpose. The culmination of Operation Render the code name for the hunt for Patterson, took the community aback. Following more than four years evading capture, Patterson made the decision to surrender at a police station in Madrid. His decision was likely influenced by the collapse of the Monaghan case. In June 2014, he reached out to solicitors, consenting to return to Scotland to confront the allegations. 
Patterson's DNA was identified on the handle of a Tesco bag containing the firearm used in Carroll's assassination. Additionally, evidence presented by a telecommunications expert pinpointed Patterson's mobile phone to the Asda car park mere seconds before the fatal shooting at 1.23 p.m. A phone call made to this device at a critical juncture was instrumental in placing him at the crime scene, marking a pivotal moment in the investigation. During the sentencing, Judge Lord Armstrong imposed a minimum term of 22 years imprisonment on Patterson. The judge elucidated, based on the evidence presented to this court, it is clear that the murder was not only preconceived, but executed with meticulous planning and calculation by you and accomplices. This act was far from a spontaneous occurrence. It constituted a deliberate execution. Drop your thoughts and feedback in the comments section down below. If you reckon my sleuthing breakdown's been a bit of an eye-opener, make sure you like this vid, share it with your mates, and subscribe to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel. Don't skip on bashing the bell icon as well, so you're in the loop every time I drop a new video. I value your support massively and can't wait to catch up with you tomorrow. Until then, keep that curiosity alive and never stop hunting for the truth.